Today we're going to build very rapidly a piece of code that does something fun. That's the plan for the day. Um, let me start by handing out yes, some dealy bobbers full of stuff. Um, specifically, some sheets full of pseudocode that we'll need later. So if you could start these around, everybody will have one by the time we need one. The plan for the day is to build a program that plays a game called Chomp. Now, Chomp was carefully chosen to be the simplest possible game. And uh, because, of, because we're going to try to build all the code for that in roughly an hour once we get started here. Um, what you need to have to be able to do this is you need a uh, laptop if you want to play along. You can, you're welcome to just sit and watch, but it'll be kind of boring because after a while we'll just be coding. But if you want to play, you need a laptop. And on your laptop, you need to be able to execute code in your favorite programming language. Whatever tools you want, we really don't care. We're going to be completely language agnostic. The stuff I'm handing out over there is pseudocode. It's pseudo because it's not written in any particular language. And so hopefully, that'll be helpful. And that's only for the core part, everything else. The plan is this. We're going to, um, I'm going to talk for just a couple minutes about what it is we're going to do, explain some of the theory behind it, and then um, we're going to, um, like I say, write a bunch of code, and we'll see how fast we can get something that will actually beat you at a game of skill. And that's the cool thing, is that at the end of this, we'll have a program that, a game AI that you've built that will actually beat you on an interesting game of skill. Um, um, and again, my apologies for late start. There we go. Should, should be seeing video. Yay, we are seeing video. We are now in a position to proceed. Um, so these slides and everything else will be up here at some point. Um, now nah, let's do it this way. There we go. So, uh, that's not the one I wanted apparently. Start presentation, that was what I wanted. So this is the game of Chomp. It's probably one of the simplest games you could ever play. It's tic-tac-toe-like in its complexity, but it is actually more challenging to play than tic-tac-toe. The basic rules are, of Chomp are sim simple. Think of this as a chocolate bar. And think of these little circles here as squares of chocolate. I don't know why I didn't make them squares. I just didn't. Um, the idea of Chomp is that on your turn, you um, take a rectangle of the chocolate bar that's sort of all the things to the right of some square and all the things below it and everything in between. You take a rectangle of that chocolate bar away. You eat it. This one's poison. So we take turns, and the person who has to eat the poison square of chocolate loses. That's the whole story of Chomp. Um, you can see there's a lot of choices for a first move. There's, uh, there's uh, 12 choices, and one of them obviously not so wise. But there are 12 choices that you could make for the first move. And depending on what the first move is, then there will be somewhat less for the second move, and so on. Um, and to understand how game AIs work, um, I want you to think for a minute about sort of an imaginary game of chomp. You know, you start by looking at a position and you imagine how the game might go. You know, you'll play this, then I'll play this, and then you'll play this, and then I'll play this. And eventually, somebody wins because in an a game of chomp has to get over because you'll eventually run out of little chocolate squares. And the game has to get over with somebody winning because somebody has to eat the poison square. There's no ties. So. You know, pictorially, and that's kind of hard to see in the back, I'm sorry, but not so much space. Um, you know, we start with the full board, and maybe I playing square. This is a traditional way you draw these things. I, I'm playing square, you, you know, you're playing circle. I playing square, choose this move, maybe. And uh, you ch playing circle, then take these ones off the top and end up here. And then I say, well, I'm going to take this one right here. And, uh, and you know, you're going to, sorry, I'm going to, put you in this position, you're going to put me in this position, and there I am. Uh, at the end, um, you've carefully chosen to do this, and there I am with 
eating the, the magic square and then I, that I lost. This says square loses, it should say circle loses actually because it's circle that ate the poison square, typo. Oh well, it happens. So the point is that you, know, you sort of can see an outcome like this and you, you ask, well, what did circle do wrong? Well, maybe nothing, right? Maybe circle's doomed to lose no matter what they do. Um, it's, this game, sort of provably, there is a best strategy and the best strategy is either a win for the first player or it's a win for the second player. Those are really the only two choices. Um, but it might be that Circle just made a mistake. Circle had a lot of choices here um, and had a, lot, had a couple of choices here, right? What might have been a better move? Um, yeah, just take one of these or something like that. There's lots of choices here. So what you do instead is you say, well, we've got to consider all the options. And you know, the, way, the easiest way to do that is to think about this as a uh, tree and as a computer scientist, or, you know, that's sort of a Latin word for people who draw trees upside down. And so you, know, you sort of think about, suppose that I knew this position was a win and this position was a loss. Well, then if I have the choice here of going to one of these two positions, which one am I going to take for the side on move, for square? Which one am I going to take? I'm going to take the one that loses for square. And so I can do that, so this is a winning position for me. right? And similarly, over here, I'm going to win no matter what move I make, because they're all losses for a square. But over here, oh, this isn't so good a position to be in, because there's no way for me to win. I don't have any choices about how to move. And you can carry that logic all the way to the bottom. right? On the bottom are a whole bunch of, of leaves all labeled the same. right? They're all labeled, I ate the last square of chocolate, so I lose, the poison square of chocolate, so I lose. And, uh, and uh, you know, what you're going to do is what's called backing up the position toward the root. And you know, if this is the tree we're looking at, then we see that there's a way for a square to win, not by doing this and not by doing this, but by doing this. And so the overall position is called you know, a winning position for square. OK, cool. But the problem is you don't want to build these trees, because they get big really fast. They take a lot of memory. Um, and there's no reason to build the tree. Instead, we use depth first search. We say, well, we'll go down to the left until we get to a leaf, and then we'll back out, you know, then we'll recursively return. So we're going to have to deal with recursion. Recursion's hard, but we can do it. We have to deal with some recursion. We're going to back out and then back things up that way. So that's the basic plan here. That's all there is to this, is we're going to um, write at the core of this player is going to be a recursive function that I gave you the pseudocode for that basically walks through the thing looking to see if there's a winning move. And if not, what do we do? Suppose I'm in um, this, horrid, uh, sorry, this horrid situation here as circle. What, what do I do? Because I can't find a winning move. There aren't any. Yeah, give up. But how do I, I don't just eat the poison square now, right? That would be crazy. I make some kind of stalling move. And if you look at the pseudocode I gave you carefully, what it does is try to make just take a single square off and hope that my opponent makes a mistake, right? All this is computed based on the idea that my opponent will never make a mistake. Here's some news for you. Humans make mistakes a lot in this game. <laughs> so the computer, even though, you know, I, I have my computer player actually play second because it turns out this game, Chomp, is a first player win on a four by three board like we're playing with. But it doesn't matter because it will sit there and beat you in the first 20 games because you'll make mistakes. It's a really hard game for humans to play. So that's what we're going to build today. Um, we're going to recursively try all the moves. If we find a winning move because the opponent loses, then you're winning. You should take your winning move. Otherwise, you're losing if your opponent plays perfectly. So we'll stall and assume our opponent might not play perfectly because that would be nice. Clear enough? Yay. All right. So. Let me talk you through this um, pseudocode for just a second here, and then we'll be good to go. Um, it'll be 1017, which is about when I wanted to start, so I guess we're not too far behind. Um, um, so the pseudocode has one bug in it, which is part of why I want to talk you through it. I printed it last night in too much of a hurry. Um, this line right here, sorry, that's too small to read. Let me make it big enough. You can read it. Um, this line right here um, that, that on your sheet reads r equals 0 and c equals 0, um, that line should say rx equals 0, cx equals 0. So I would strongly suggest you correct that before you start or at least notice or remember. So apologies for that. Um, did everybody get a copy, by the way? I printed like 40. OK, good, good. I'm glad. Um, 
So here's the plan. Here's the overall plan. You're going to build some struct. You're going to build some struct or whatever, or object or whatever it is your language has that sort of just keeps track of row and column indices because it's really convenient to do. That should take you five lines of code in 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> you're going to have a board. And the easiest way is to make the board be sort of an array of, a two-dimensional array of Booleans. I hope your target language handles two-dimensional arrays reasonably. If not, you'll have more of a pain in the neck. But you can deal with it. Um, in the pseudocode, I assume the arrays are zero-based because that's more convenient. Um, like I say, I would, you know, I would parameterize it because you might want to change the board sizes later and see what happens. But you know, for, for this tutorial, we're going to have three rows by four columns. That's how we're going to play. Um, then you're going to write, you know, you're going to make sure you can initialize a board to have all the squares of chocolate on at the start. Now, again, a few lines of code. None of these are big, right? I didn't give you pseudocode for them because it would be kind of insulting if you know how to program for most of these. They should be easy. Um, then, you know, Sort of you want some code that sort of prints a board in ASCII so that you can show the human user what's going on as you play. Um, I used O and dot as the basic board characters. I'll show you in a minute. Um, then you're going to write a function that sort of takes a move from the human and makes it on the board. You need that so that the human can play too, right? And that's probably the biggest pain in the neck in most languages to write because ew, I-O, and parsing, and bleh. Um, I'll show you what I did, but um, it's pretty straightforward. And have it just return a valid move object so that you know what the move is, and then you can make it on the board. Um, don't do error checking. Look, this, you know, if you waste a bunch of time doing error checking and making everything beautiful and user friendly, you're going to go nuts. And do do ASCII. Don't try to write GUI code. We don't have time. Um, you know, my function was this little seven liner. It works fine. Um, then you write a function that, yeah, that sort of actually executes the move, right? So given a move object, it says, OK, I'm going to delete all the things to the right and below you know, the square that you give me is the move target square so that you can actually clear out part of the board. And then there's this negamax code. Let me, let me say a few things about this. Um, I don't think it's actually self-explanatory. The basic, you know, it assumes, first of all, that you can alter this board B, that it's passed by reference. This D, the depth, isn't actually used for very much, so don't get confused by it. It just keeps track of how deep you are in that tree. The only thing that it's used for is if it's depth zero, then we assume that you're at the top of the tree and actually want to move. And so that's the only thing we're using it for. The basic strategy is to scan over all the squares, looking for squares that still have chocolate and that are not the poison chocolate square. And if we find such a square, then we go ahead and say, well, let's remember that that was a legal move because later we might need it if we're in trouble. And then we'll make a copy of the board we have and make a move on that copy. And then we'll recurse. Here's the recursion. Um, we'll recurse and see if, you know, see if there's a win for the opponent's side. Um, in that position. Notice what's happening here. We've switched sides. It's now the opponent's turn. So if there's a true down here, if the, if the opponent can win, then um, we want to keep going. We don't want to use that move, because that means we would lose making that move. Clear enough? So now, having, uh, having, having decided that, oh, the opponent loses in this position, then um, if we're at the top level, then this is the move we want to make, right? So we actually, you know, if, if we're at the top level, we actually make the move on the board. We print the move so that we see what happened. We print that the program is winning because it's nice to let the user know that <laughs> they're going to die. And then um, you return trues indicating, yes, this is a winning position for us. If I get all the way out of this for loop, then what's going to happen? What's going to happen is um, I'm going to have to make something. I use this move I've saved and just make it. Notice that it saves the last move it saw that was legal, and that's going to be one at the lower right-hand edge, and so it's only going to be one square, and uh, you know, it'll be a, a good stalling move. We'll show that, and if, if we had to eat the poison square, then we say, well, we lost. But otherwise, we say, well, you know what, we're losing. And we return false in any case, indicating, oh yeah, um, you should know that this is not a winning position for the side on move. Clear enough? I mean, that was really fast through it, and you don't actually need to understand it to <laughs> implement it. That's the joy of pseudocode, which is a wonderful thing, but it helps. So I thought I'd talk you through it. And then you just write a main program that drives all that. Let me show you how this actually looks, and then we'll get started. Um, how it actually looks is, oh, sorry, I don't know why I did that, um, is uh, here's my Java player. Um, 
I, I know it's down at the bottom. Maybe I can fix that somehow just a second. Oops. Fix it too much. There we go. That's a little easier to see. So um, you, you can see my little board I've drawn with the poison square and all the other squares, and they're full of chocolate. And um, my move input, I decided to just take a two digit number and use that, so it's row column. So what should I start with? Let's start with, um, oh, let's start with three, four. Oops. What just happened? Oh, it scrolled, but it wasn't that I was. I see. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's fix it some more. Um, there. We'll just leave it up at the top like that. And I say 3, 4, and it says, oh, well, then I'm going to use 2, 3. And if I take 2, 3, then, by the way, you now lose. Um, that smiley face is the computer being happy because it now has proven that no matter what you do, you can't win this game. It is, you've put it in a winning position and it is unhappy to be you. And we can sit there and play that out. We might as well make it quick because, you know, so we'll go um, one, two, and it will um, eat the rest of that column as well it should, right? And here we are. It's like, you're going to lose now. <laughs> and uh, so we'll go ahead and play 1-1, one, one, which is the only legal move. And it says, oh, right, you win. <laughs> so um, there you are. That's what it's supposed to look like when you've got it working. Are there questions? I'm sure there will be questions as we go along, but are there questions before we get started? Like I say, for me, this was about 100 lines of Java code. Um, you know, a little less actually, 80 or 90. Um, and, you know, it took me 30 minutes to write. Uh, I expect it'll take you longer because you haven't done this a million billion times in the past. If we get done a little early, if most of us get done a little early, I'll say a few words at the end, but mostly I won't interrupt you except to take questions. So, are we ready? Is everybody psyched? I'm psyched. This is fun. I'm going to try to write in Haskell while, while you're going too so that I, so that I, I have some fun um, also. Good to go? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so it's not equal for the... No, it's, it's Rx instead of R. There is, no, there is no, really no R at that point, so when you get there, you'll be like, oh, wait, what the heck is R? He must amend Rx, but, uh, you know, thought I'd give you the heads up in advance. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? Go, write computer programs. Don't wait for me. <laughs> this is, the, this is the, the nice part about this talk is it's the easy kind of talk to give. You write computer programs and I stay out of your way. Um, like I say, I'm going to sit down and start writing an actual Haskell implementation and uh, see if I can't get it going reasonably quick because um, Haskell's fun. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it well, it's 12 deep at most because there's only 12 possible squares, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You'll never blow the stack and you'll never even go very deep. This was a, chosen to be a crazily. It's a good question. You know, somebody was concerned wait, doesn't this blow up because, you know, you run out of time and space? And for any reasonable size game, of course, the answer is yes. You can't build chess quite like that because you can't quite play to the end of every possible chess game. Even if you're careful with memory, which you won't really run out of because you only go as deep as the maximum length of a chess game, you'll run out of time. <laughs> but uh, for this game, it's short enough and it was deliberately chosen to be short enough that you can just search the whole thing. Tic-tac-toe, ch uh, you know, chomp, there's a few games that are small enough that you can do that. So yeah. Um, 
let's see, what's the next thing I was supposed to do? Right board thing. Um, oh, God. I'm going to hate this. Why am I in fundamental mode? Oh, weird. Do I not have it loaded? Oh, interesting. Right, 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 right. Got this wrong. Don't. I was afraid of that. Oh, right, it's a list array I want. Um, oh, right, I need a pair of indices.
much. Still not out right. Freaking Haskell Rays. Okay.
excellent. Oh. Okay. What's next? Yay, Haskell. Takes a string to an A. It's got a string. What's the type of move? One thing I should say, pro should have said at the beginning probably, when you code the Negamax code, if you get there, which you're probably getting close-ish now, be really, really careful because it's really, really, really hard to debug. Um, the problem is that if you have a little bug, you know, it, it's going to be buried in some recursive call 30 deep that it manifests itself. And so your debugger doesn't help you and your reasoning doesn't help you very much. You'll be like, why is it making bad moves? 
I can't tell. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, you want to test everything else really carefully to make sure that isn't, or, you know, to make sure that's not buggy. And for that thing, you just want to be really careful about it. It's hard, you know, because debugging is so hard. What? Yeah, yeah, or maybe you do leave bugs on purpose because you don't like losing to your computer. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but if you're trying to, to lose, then that's the way to do it. Okay. 
unwrapping and unwrapping, driving me nuts. Okay. Um.
I completely forget the meaning of the up and down arrow symbol. Is up arrow and down arrow yeah, yeah, sorry. I should have probably not written those as V and wedge. Yeah, the, the wedge-shaped one that sort of looks like an up arrow is an and, and the V-shaped one that kind of looks like a, a, a V is an or. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. that. Ah, I see. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I should have said something, and I should have written it more clearly. My apologies. It's sort of a standard pseudocode thing, but... In, in academia, but that doesn't mean that it was easy to understand. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. And I, I always forget. Uh, there you go. That works. That works. A completely useless mnemonic is that those symbols are actually derived from the symbols for set union and set intersection. And the, one, the V is supposed to look like a U and the <laughs> other thing's supposed to look like a, a cap. Yeah. Yes. Did you need to be reminded at any particular point in time? Um, I don't think so. When are we supposed? To, when are we scheduled to be finished? Uh, we have to. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we got plenty of time. I'm, yeah, I'll, I'm on top of it. But thanks.
replace that whole thing with a fold. Wow. Did I get these wrong? Uh, that could be a little confusing, I guess. Did I frick up somewhere? I don't think there are any rights that I did that. Yes. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you if it's useful in your testing. Do, do, do people want to know? All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the way you figure out the winning strategy is kind of sad. I mean, you could do it by sort of building special code to do it, or you can do it by just playing a lot of games of chomp. But yeah. Um, <laughs> and I chose plan B. Um, yeah, the, the, um, you start out with two... And I say the winning strategy, there may be more than one, but I know at least one of them. If you start out with two, three here, then it's not happy. And if you continue that with, um, now I have to remember, right, with a one, three, then it's still not happy. And you can now see why it's not happy, right? Because there's no parity thing. People have described, my programming language friends describe this as sort of 2D NIM. I think that's probably fair if you've ever played NIM. And so it's, it's all about parity. And so now, um, you know, sort of I can take uh, obviously 2, 2, and uh, it doesn't really have any great choices. So it just takes a square and hopes that I make a mistake that I couldn't possibly make. <laughs> there you go. So that's, that's roughly the winning plan, is you, you, you carve a square off the lower right-hand corner on your first move, and then on your second move, you, um, you know, and then it does whatever it's going to do, but 
depending on what it does, you now have something that can start out. I mean, I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't say that's the winning strategy because it depends on, you know, for this pseudocode it is because this pseudocode deterministically chooses to always stall by picking the lower rightmost um, square. If, if, you, if you chose to randomly pick some square for your stalling move, then you force the opponent to figure out what's going on all over again. So this is kind of, you know, a weak player in the sense that once you figure it out, you get to repeat your win over and over, but it shouldn't be like that. It's a good adjustment to the pseudocode to actually fix that. So say this again, what happens here? Shouldn't be right though, that should be fail. Oh no, yeah, that's right. Let's try again. Um, one, two, that's better. Yay! Haskell's so funny. <laughs> Bless you.
Really? Okay. <coughs> if you want to move, I already know what it looks like. I can pretty clearly see the poster on there. Got it. error and pattern make move. Oh, right, 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 right. <coughs> oh, that. There's that, I guess. If it makes that a dumbass idea.
So we have about 20 minutes left. How many people think they're going to make it easily? Three quarters. Some of you are done already. OK, good, good. And there's probably 10 or 15 minutes left. Maybe I'll say a few more words just to close up. And the, those of you who aren't done can keep working and ignore me, and the rest of you will have something to do. So, so who's done already? What language did the people who are done write in? Ruby. Ruby. Python. 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 I see. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Python looks more like pseudocode than most languages. That is true. Uh, you could argue that Haskell even looks more like pseudocode than most languages. But since it isn't imperative, it, I couldn't really write from the pseudocode. I kind of had to ignore it. <laughs> so I'm just now getting done. I'll be done in a minute and a half. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I'd be, I'd be happy to show both the, my Java solution and my Haskell solution. You can compare if you want. Um, yeah, the, 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 the Java solution is actually on GitHub, I believe. Um, and I'll put the Haskell solution up there when I'm done so that people can play with it. Um, yeah. What now? Ooh, that's a bug. I don't like the computer's move there. Oh, right. Nope, still got a bad bug. Interesting. <sighs> Shouldn't think it's happy. All right.
Okay, that's clearly buggy. Oh. really was right the first time. Yeah, yeah still it shouldn't happen. All right, so I am finished in an hour and 10 minutes in Haskell or at least close enough to finish that I'm willing to call it a day. I still need to get the little poison square to, to be an ASCII star in the upper left-hand corner. I can live without that right now. Um, so how many people are done now that weren't done before when I asked? OK, another four or five. What, did, what all did you all write in? JavaScript. Python. Python. OK, so is there anybody here who didn't write in a dynamic language like JavaScript, Python, or Ruby? Two pe three people, four people. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> See, in a computer science class, it would be the exact opposite. There would be four or five of, in a room this size that did, and the rest of you not so much. So what, what did the rest of you use? Closure. Closure. OK, so Pearl. Pearl. Java. Java. OK, so one of the not a dynamic language was actually Pearl. Got it. Um, and what was the last one? Scala. Scala. OK, so we got a Clojure, a Scala, and a Java. OK, interesting. Sure, of course. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you, you know, you'll notice that most, if you were watching at all when I was typing, you'll notice that most of my time was spent fixing static type errors, right? Um, because Haskell and uh, getting all the types right and stuff. And it really helped me get my code almost correct, but not quite correct, because I'd flipped a couple of cases at one point and had to fix something right at the end. Um, so the, the last thing I wanted to say is that the secret here is that now you know how to build a chess program. A chess program works just like this. OK, not really. <laughs> a chess program is a little bit fancier version of this same general strategy. For all I know, there's some mathematical trick you can do to win games of chomped. I wouldn't be, chomp. I wouldn't be surprised. But you don't need to, because you can apply this general strategy. All we do in chess is, since we can't search all the way to the bottom, because there's too many games, we just cut off arbitrarily and then use a heuristic to estimate who's winning. Um, you know, after some depth. And that's really the only difference we do. And then we use a few tricks to make it go faster so that it's fast enough to play well. But um, mostly it's this same general strategy. And in general, if you're trying to build an AI for a game that's two player and they're playing against each other, or even if you're trying to build 
an AI for some other situation where two people are competing against each other. This isn't a bad plan. The important thing here isn't sort of the details of Chomp or the details of the particular pseudocode I handed you. It's this strategic idea that if you're going to compete against somebody, you want to figure out you know, what, all, what all the options are that you, know, you have, and then you want to figure out with best play how your opponent would respond to those options. And the way you do that is let your opponent figure out with best play how you would respond to their responses. It's that strategy of recursive Negamax search that really actually turns out to be one of the great innovations of the 20th century in terms of how we think about how games are played. And that's pretty much what I have to say. Everybody who hasn't finished, you know, feel free to finish. I'll hang around either here or down in the lounge if I need to get out of the way and we can chat some more. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like I s yeah, if people want to put their code up on GitHub, that would be great. I suppose we should have a GitHub, whatever the heck it is you have um, for now. Yeah. Yeah, good plan. Good plan. Put a put a link to your put a link to your GitHub repo on the session pages. That's a brilliant plan. So yeah, absolutely. And so yeah, I'd really love to see other people's solutions. I'm really curious. Um, thank you so much. I hope this was fun, useful, something we would want to do again. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Thanks very much. I mean, it was kind of the perfect session for me, right? Because nobody had to sit and listen to me talk most of the time. <laughs> I should show you. I promised I'd show off some code here. Let me see if I can still do that. If we have a few seconds. Yeah, the Haskell code. I was translating to functional Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was careful to kind of keep as little bit trapped in the I.O. monad as I could sort of figure out how to get away with. So that was why I kind of didn't really follow the pseudocode is because I was kind of having the thing instead of returning a boolean return a move and it's some indication of whether the move was winning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, um, and so yeah, the data structures that set everything up here are just a little board, which is a good old Haskell array. Haskell has arrays. They aren't terribly efficient because you copy them all the time, but oh well, I don't care. And, uh, <laughs> and a little move data structure, and then you just build kind of sort of the obvious stuff. I mean, I don't know, for some definition of obvious. If you don't read Haskell, maybe not so much. But, uh, but this is just how you print a board. It just turns the, it just formats the, the, the array in, a, in some sort of sensible way. This is how you print a move. Um, I just print it as a tuple because I'm lazy. Here's how you get a move, and this is probably the most trickiest line for people who are learning Haskell is that you sort of have to trap it in the IO monad and then you use do's and then you use this get line function which does IO and the rest of it's just straight Haskell, it's boring. Uh, the make move function uses this little array update operator which turns out to be just the right thing for our particular situation. Um, and remember, I didn't, you know, I, did, I didn't start looking stuff up in advance. I mean, this was just, oh, I better go look at the Haskell documentation for the array uh, module and it, it's all right in there and you can sort of figure it out pretty fast. It still returns a copy, right? Yeah, it still returns a copy. So this is not efficient. I mean, if you were trying to do this for real, you'd have to figure out something better to do. But um, for, you know, I don't care because I carefully chose this game so that the slowest language anybody had, which by the way was Python, um, <laughs> would still execute it at a reasonable speed. Um, Ruby might have been slow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and depending on the weather. Anyway, they're both very, very slow. Um, the yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. In that situation, but the JavaScript interpreter is scary these days. Gosh. So, um, so this is the actual Negamax core, and it's mostly just this little pipeline here that just goes and figures out all the possible moves. This line figures out all the possible moves and discards the one that would lose. Um, because we treat that special because we can. And then it's just call Negamax right here, and if, if the other side's winning, then, um, you, you know, then, um, you know, you're not winning, and otherwise, um, you know, if the other side's losing, then you're winning. Um, and, uh, yeah, so um, that's the whole story pretty much. Um, it's not too... It's not too fancy, it's not too much code, and I will post it on GitHub what, so that people can look at it. There? What? I, I, I was expecting just a maybe a move. Because I want to be able to know both the move and whether or not the computer thinks it's winning. Because, you know, because I need to be able to tell so that I can do the negamax and also because I want to print the little smiley faces. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I really need to tell anyway for the computer can do the megamax. So, and, 
Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like one. It's it's marked with one or the other. It, you know, yeah. It's it's kind of like a pair, except that Haskell keeps track of all the stuff for you and makes sure that everything works out right. The the left hand side of that pair, the the your losing side, is a maybe because it might be that there's no legal moves and you're losing, or it might be that there is a legal move and you're losing. If you're winning, there's always a legal move. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. Right. If you didn't care about the smiley. I'd still have to return an either M, either move, I think, because I have to return both a move so that I can make it at the top level. See, the problem is I'm lifting the making the move out of the right, negamax right. where it is in the pseudocode, and so I need to return both a move and an indication of whether it's winning or losing because, oh yeah, because no, the recursive call, because the recursive call in the negamax needs it. It needs to know if the other side's winning to know whether it's losing or not. <laughs> so you need both pieces of information. The other way you can do that is just with, do it with a tuple of Boolean and move, but the. <laughs> Uh, no. Oh, you're right. Mm -hmm. you're right. <laughs> Haskell is hard. The Java code is much easier to read. <laughs> uh, well, for people who aren't, yeah, for, for some definition of easy, yes, but it looks pretty much like the pseudocode. There's nothing magic here at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if, you, if somebody handed you a pseudocode that looks just like the code, yeah. <laughs> You absolutely may. You absolutely may. I'm going to put a copy of this. I, I couldn't figure out how to get my files uploaded to the wiki um, last night, so I'm going to ask somebody for some help for that today. So everything I showed you will be on the wiki, hopefully very, very shortly. Um, so yeah, feel free to use it however you will. Um, I don't think I properly got licenses on everything, but I'll fix that sometime soon. <laughs> Thanks much. This was a lot of fun for me. <laughs> Can you run